summer was pretty scary. Uh, and I think only because of the extremely experienced now and ramped up uh, fire suppression activities of DNRC and even Forest Service to jump on every start as quickly as possible. Last year easily could have been another 1910 type of event considering the ignitions and where they could have gone. So uh, this summer right now uh, is looking pretty frightening as well. So um, if there's any work that you can do to reduce fuels in the next three, four months, um, I would suggest you make that a high priority. And even on, on my 20 acres, uh, there's a patch that I've been putting off and I'm working on it right now. So <coughs> it's, um, you know, we, we could be in for, or for quite, quite the ride this summer. So anyways, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I just, you know, it's, the, the predictions are all there. survey, uh, we got a real good registration for Mini College uh, for this time. This is the second year we're doing it in February. Uh, historically, we've done it in the fall. Um, does that just show the hands? Uh, do How many of you prefer this time of year for this venue? Okay, I don't <laughs> think I need to go any further. Well, that was our, 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 our thought process because I know fall is very busy for me. Um, just on my own property and for, and for folks and it was always a crunch to squeeze it in between football weekends because we can't do it when there's a football <laughs> game here and this time of year I know I always get the itch to get working on things outside and so well, I'm, I'm glad to hear it we will based on last year and this year we will continue to do it at this time of year so uh, I'm glad that works out so I guess we're, we're close enough I guess to when, we're, when we should start and uh, have a lot of uh, a lot of things to cover. So uh, a couple of months ago, um, I got asked by the Foresters Forum. This is a get together over in Coeur d'Alene every January, uh, where we try to do updates for the professional forestry community. And so I got called by uh, the owner of Northwest Management, probably the largest consulting firm now in the uh, inland Northwest. They work all the way down to Colorado. And cover 10 different states, and ask uh, what I could present based on the drought situation, because last summer, even though uh, we dodged a bullet largely um, due to the impacts of our fire suppression teams, eastern Washington got hit really hard. And, um, you know, same conditions, their, their, their teams had just not been dealing with it as badly as we have because of the way climatic patterns are typically a little wetter. Uh, so, but last summer uh, it caught up with them big time, and so they asked um, Vinny Correo asked me, "Well, what do you know about this drought, and what what are the predictions for the future?" And so, without thinking, I said, "Well, yeah, I can put something together for you." And uh, the more I dug into this, uh, the more I was kind of kicking myself because it's it's quite the can of worms. <clears throat> and so, um, I broke it down into I think which is a perhaps a a logical way of looking at it, and we'll um, try and, if that's okay with you, uh, give you a, a perspective of what's involved, all involved with this simple question of, you know, what's what's happening with the drought and our forests and all of that, and hopefully leave you with some uh, practical information of things you can actually do on uh, your land that, that can make a difference. And um, I own... Oh, to introduce, um, most of you know me, but I'm Peter Kolb. I'm the MSU Extension Forestry Specialist. I also have the position as an adjunct associate professor here at the University of Montana College of Forestry and Conservation as a forest ecology and management professor because my career and my academic aspirations have been always to try and connect the basic ecology work that's done, uh, which is what I did most of my research on, with the real life management implications. Okay, it's, it's one thing to, to identify all these things that are going on, it's another thing to say, okay, 
how does that impact me? How does that impact what I do and what I can do? So that's kind of been my 30 year uh, career across the, the Northern Rockies and that's where I've really focused my research and my work um, and I've been blessed to be able to do that. I grew up in Wisconsin, uh, got my bachelor's at Michigan State University, worked for the Wisconsin DNR uh, for a year and then moved out to the University of Idaho to start a graduate program uh, back in January of 1984. And, uh, um, the Northern Rockies is a very special place, uh, both socially but uh, um, eco um, ecologically. And so this is where I've really specialized my work and my experience, and so I'm kind of combined that to, to try and give some practical applied answers to some of these overwhelming theoretical questions that occur. So inland northwest drought, this is uh, uh, northwest Montana. Um, and we have these dense, highly productive forests for a variety of reasons. Um, but if you stay on the same latitude and just go a couple hundred miles to the east, uh, you're in the Charlie Russell area. Um, and I kind of chose these two pictures because they're somewhat analogous topographically. Um, but the only difference between this and the previous picture is moisture. Okay, so you know, with global warming predictions and climate change and all that kind of stuff, um, I have a few faculty that I sometimes duel with a little bit because, as far as they're concerned, by 2080, this is what the Northern Rockies will look like, um, and you know, I can't with any uh, certainty say that's not going to happen, but uh, we'll examine the evidence that's out there. Um, I don't view my job as telling you what you should think. I'm just going to present to you uh, the different avenues of research and venues of, of perhaps what we know uh, is going on and how these things work. And of course, water is uh, without a doubt the most determining and limiting factor that determines uh, vegetation patterns across uh, the northern Rockies, uh, as well as productivity and what species can grow where. This happens to be the Dearborn River between Great Falls and Lincoln. Uh, that I happened to catch one early morning last fall. Um, and it just shows this massive, this transition of, besides being a nice picture, and it's kind of <laughs> nice to rest your eyes on. So I drove by it and I go, wow, I gotta take a picture of that. So I turned around and went back. Uh, anyways, so when I look at uh, <clears throat> the newly established uh, federal climate hubs that are there to deal with climate change and pro provide recommendations, um, I downloaded, this is their most recent uh, um, publication on climate change and how it's going to impact us. So one, drought projections suggest that some regions of the U.S. will become drier and then most will have more extreme variations in, in, in moisture, precipitation. Two, if current drought patterns remain unchanged, warmer temperatures will amplify the drought effects. Now I'll, I'll go into exactly what that means. Uh, three. Uh, drought and warmer temperatures may increase risks of large-scale insect outbreaks and larger wildfires, especially in the western U.S. Four, drought and warmer temperature may accelerate tree and shrub death, changing habitats, ecosystems in favor of drought-tolerant species. Five, forest-based products and values such as timber, water, habitat, and recreation opportunities may be negatively impacted. And six, forest and rangeland managers can mitigate some of these impacts and build resili resiliency in forests through appropriate management actions. So. That's the official uh, statements to everybody with regard to where things are going, and so I can shut up and we can be done, and you can go have coffee, right? Uh, yeah, uh, anyways, well, we have a habit of, particularly in agencies, of putting out these philosophical statements that um, are sort of interesting, but you know, for a specific forest manager, okay, I've noticed a lot of that stuff, but what does that really tell me and what can I do? So. Uh, moving on. And last summer, as I already mentioned, uh, was a record summer in some ways. Record, and when I say that, and I'll elaborate on that more, record in the last 20 years or so, okay? We tend to think of climate uh, and, and weather within our realm of experiences, and I don't know about you folks, but uh, you know, really, how much snow there was in 1997 I remember there was a lot, but you know, um, you know, we, we tend to, our, our brains tend to moderate these types of things a little bit in our brain. And 
you know, we tell our kids, oh, you have nothing to worry about. 97, now that was a real winner. You know, and they go, yeah, 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 I heard that before, um, type of things. But last summer, um, in the last 20, 30 years, um, many of our rivers that are perennial rivers came close to drying up. The St. Regis River almost dried up. It went underground, and there were just potholes here and there. And that's certainly the first time I've seen that happen in 30 years. Um, and as you may recall, last spring, the snow came off the mid-elevation slopes about this time. Uh, same type of thing. Uh, the snow tell, which are snowpack, uh, snow water um, equivalent measurements, showed us that uh, by January last year, we were actually 120% of normal, of average. But the mid-elevation snow came off. And we saw what the impacts were. Um, you know, that high elevation snowpack came off really quick in the spring. And so, you know, we, we saw some things last summer that uh, um, we hadn't seen before. Now, when you consider the varied landscape across Montana and how um, all the things that are going on there, uh, coming up with simple statements and averages is really, really hard. Because, you know, if you're in the Arley Valley, which is right there in the front range, in front, it might be a bit different than if you're in the Swan. Uh, which might be different than if you're up uh, in Libby country and so on and so forth. Uh, so, you know, it, it averages are something that are things that are used a lot, but uh, often they do us a great disservice because um, forestry and managing a forest is a site-specific endeavor. I mean, that's the one thing I try to pound into all our students and everybody else is we come up with these broad-scale um, ways of doing things and management strategies. But truly forestry is all about identifying specifically what the heck is going on right here. It's species and soils and aspect um, because this spot might have had a big rainstorm uh, or a rain cloud parked over it uh, for a couple of hours and it dumped rain on there and right where I'm standing it was hot and dry and didn't get anything. So all forest management uh, really needs to be done on a site-specific <coughs> basis. And so when I think about you know, this greater issue of drought and climate and all of that stuff, I said, well, okay, how do I tackle this type of thing? And this, of course, is, um, I believe, the high woods in central Montana. It was a beautiful spring day. I had to take that picture. These out island mountain ranges. And, and this uh, happens to be a limber pine that somehow a seed fell into a little rock, rock outcropping and has grown out there in the middle of nowhere. And wouldn't you believe it, the one elk bull that happened to wander by there ripped the crap out of it, you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, uh, just to emphasize the site-specific nature of forestry. Uh, but when we think about that, really, uh, we need to look at, take into account weather patterns and climate. Now, weather is what happens within a 30-year period. Climate is the trend that is 30 years or longer. People interchange the two all the time, and you really shouldn't. Because last summer, people say, oh, well, it's super hot, dry summer. It's a sign of climate change. No, it was a super hot, dry summer, which is a sign that we had a super hot, dry summer, which is weather. Okay, Climate is a long-term trend. Uh, two, topographic position and soils. Well, that's very evident in here that where you are on the landscape makes a huge difference. And soils have the capacity to buffer what happens uh, with respect to number one. Three, uh, species and genetic adaptability. I mean, there's a reason that this is a limber pine and not a Douglas fir growing there. Every species has its niche of where it grows best. But within a species, just if you'll just look at limber pine or Douglas fir, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's just like in here. I mean, some of us have hair and some of us don't. Um, the same type of genetic variability occurs within a species and when you have stress, like if you stuck me out in the Sahara Desert without a hat, I'd be the first one to croak because I have no buffer there. Okay? The same thing happens with trees in a forest. You have trees that are more susceptible to bark beetles and trees that are less susceptible to bark beetles, all within the same species, and some that are more drought adapted and some that are less drought adapted. So when you have these changes occurring, you're having a selection process going on that is weeding out individuals that may have a genetic weakness. And what that genetic weakness right now is may be a genetic strength in a different climatic time. So if it's warm and wet, that tree that has a shallow root system 
has a much better chance of getting the nutrients that are all bound up in that duff layer on the soil surface, where it's hot and dry, that tree's at a massive deficit because it doesn't have a taproot system to find water. Okay, so there's this selection process that goes on. And then finally, uh, I leave that as a question mark. Hopefully you'll know what that topic is. Um, and we're going to conclude with that as to uh, factors affecting drought. So we'll just scooch right into this. And, uh, you know, my a uh, lot of work I did uh, for my PhD dissertation was actually modeling the thermodynamics of tree seedlings or individual trees. And there, there's a lot going on if you just think of this. So, you know, you know here we have a, a large tree out there and, you know, what impacts how well it's growing out there? Well, first of all, water, okay? And that comes in the form of rain and snow. And some of it gets caught up in the, in the canopy as a snow in the tree uh, branches. And that snow tends to, for the most part, evaporate right back in the air. Okay, it doesn't melt and make it to the, to the ground. Most of the snow, and actually most of the rain we get in the summer, I mean, you've all experienced that rainstorm that comes over and drops a quarter of an inch in half an hour. Okay, well, where this specific tree is after that rainstorm, and this ring right around it, the soil will be pretty dry because it can't be caught at all. And most of that water in the canopy is not absorbed into the tree. Okay, trees don't have a good mechanism to absorb moisture through their leaves. Okay, uh, it evaporates back into the air. Okay. Similarly, what makes to the soil? Um, there's a lot of things going on there. Some of it, if it's a hot soil and you get that little rainstorm on that hot soil, it evaporates. Okay. Why do we ask? Uh, um, uh, cropland people to irrigate early morning, late night, or in the evening. Because during the day, these soil surface temperatures can get 140, 150 degrees Fahrenheit. You put water on them, and that water just sizzles right off and goes back in the atmosphere. It doesn't make it into the soil. Okay? So there's loss by evaporation. How well that water is absorbed by the soil depends on uh, infiltration rates, whether it's compacted or not, uh, whether it's been puddled by rain and, and equipment. Um, whether it's hot organic debris that captures that water and it evaporates right back. Okay, so there's, that's a whole study unto, unto itself. And then finally, what moisture does make in the soil, it's a question of whether it's stored there or not. So if you have a sandy soil, the water goes right through and ends up in a groundwater source. If it's a clay soil, it gets trapped in that clay, but it isn't released very easily by that clay. So if you have a nice deep silt loam type of soil, that's the best because the water gets into it, it holds that water but not so tightly so that plants and trees can get it. That would be, uh, and I'll show you a picture of the, the uh, Mount Mazama ash cap soils are ideal for growing stuff because they hold water so well. Okay, so there's this, just that little part. Well, then trees themselves lose water just in the process of photosynthesis to absorb carbon dioxide, they have their stomates open, the little pores in their needles, and water gets pulled out. Anytime the humidity is lower than 100%, that air has a tremendous suction. And when the relative humidity is down at 30%, which is very common in our summer daytime temperature, that suction is over 200 pounds per square inch of suction of pulling water out. And because a water molecule is about half the size of a carbon dioxide molecule, the tree loses water at about twice the rate that it absorbs carbon dioxide for photosynthesis and sugar production. Okay, so this transpiration effect is, is huge. I mean, the waters, the trees will blow water like mad. A full-grown cottonwood tree that has really poor control over transpiration rates can blow 200 gallons of water a day, which is why those cottonwoods will only survive as big old trees where they can get their roots into a water table, and they just they're just big water pumps. That's all they are. Okay, now ponderosa pine, our most drought um, resistant, and has this mechanism where it just shuts down its pores. Anytime the relative humidity drops below a certain amount, so in the morning it's cool, humidity's high, as soon as the temperature warms up, humidity drops, water gets sucked out of the needles, they shut down their needles. That's how pon one, of the, one of the many mechanisms that ponderosa pine has to survive. Okay. Well, some water is used for growth. You know, when photosynthesis occurs and carbon metabolism, water is part of that biochemical process as well. Sun and sun, the sun and the temperature have a huge impact because it's warmer and full sunlight 
water evaporates, the humidity drops, water evaporates off a lot quicker. Okay? Temperature is also very important because optimum photosynthesis on our trees in the northern hemisphere occurs somewhere between 70 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so that's the ideal temperature. Above 95, 96 degrees Fahrenheit, actually respiration, that's the process that we use, trees do that too. Respiration becomes greater than photosynthesis and trees have a negative loss of, of carbon. So when it's basically when it's above 96 degrees, our northern Rockies forests are adding CO2 to the atmosphere. Okay, so I mean they're polluters if if you believe the EPA. So okay, um, all right, and then also finally wind and humidity. A good wind speed for every 10 mile increase in wind speed, transpiration can double or triple. Okay, so water loss really increases with wind, and you'll notice all this on yourself too. I mean you operate the same way. If it's a hot windy day. Uh, you're thirsty all the time because as soon as you perspire to cool yourself down that moisture gets sucked off by the wind okay and so how much rain snow we get the impacts of sun and temperature and wind and humidity are the overwhelmingly powerful factors here and we can model those things actually your property tax on your forested land is called it's, it's a yield tax and it is calculated using a model that Steve Running developed that calculates the potential growth of your tree or the growth capacity of your land and that's what you're taxed on. So if you're on good soil, the right kind of temperature, precipitation pattern, you're going to pay a higher tax than if you're out in the middle of nowhere where your growth potential is really, really uh, low. Now, the fact that those models are so inaccurate that we actually had to impose a correction factor on that using actual site index measurements of how trees grow um, is important to mention as we talk about climate change a little bit because uh, those are BGC models that stands for biogeochemical cycles it's a theoretical model of how trees are supposed to grow based on temperature moisture uh, and sunlight and soil to some capacity uh, your, your taxes are now much more accurate because that model is, is, is called a relative model. Uh, it's great at modeling. If you change one thing, how does everything change? It's terrible at modeling absolute numbers. How much is your tree actually going to grow? So you calibrate that model by doing actual measurements and saying, well, this is what the trees are actually showing. You plug it into the model, and then everything uh, works out a little bit better. OK. So just to throw this up here, this is how uh, scientifically, mathematically, we might model this, where these are water potentials, how tightly the water is held by something, and same thing, but just, you know, the way um, um, us uh, uh, eggheads at the university like to quantify things. Um, all right, so to the bigger picture, okay, <clears throat> talked a little bit of, of, about modeling. Well, these days, our, our climatic trends and weather patterns are largely modeled by what are called general circulation models. So these prevailing weather patterns have been known for centuries. I mean, the hence they're called the trade winds, because if you wanted to make it to the United States uh, from, from Europe, uh, you would head south past Spain, Azores, and catch these trade winds, which would blow you across the United States. And if you wanted to go back to Europe, then you'd head north and catch the northern trade winds, and they would blow you back over to Europe. I mean, those, those are consistent uh, patterns uh, with abnormalities, of course, and when abnormalities occurred, ships sank and people died. Uh, okay, so the same thing is for for off our Pacific coast. Uh, so these general circulation models are used to model uh, carbon dioxide concentrations and cloud covers and ocean temperatures, things like that, to give us some kind of predictive ability of what's going to hit us this next summer, and also to examine what are the long-term trends. So um, the one that we're most familiar with is El Nino La Nina. Um, we've had now for the last couple of years what's called a super El Nino, where the Pacific Ocean temp surface temperature has been exceptionally warm. Okay? And that warm temperature embodies or, or imparts energy to our atmosphere and affects whether we have high pressures and low pressures and things like that. Now, a lot's made that this is a super El Nino. 
we have had three super El Ninos since the 1960s, okay? So a super El Nino tends to occur every 20 years or so, okay? It's not like the sky is falling just these last years because uh, Donald Trump is putting a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere or whatever, okay? Uh, this is a, a, a pattern that has been measured and that occurs, and then the La Nina is when that uh, Pacific surface temperature cools off. This was first identified by Chilean fishermen because <laughs> fish do best in cold water because cold hot water holds more oxygen, supports more plankton, things like that, more food sources. So in the La Nina, they had great fishing, and in the El Nino, uh, fishing collapsed because the warm water, the fish would be deeper or they'd go elsewhere. <coughs> okay, that's kind of where that all came from. And so if we look at, uh, you know, here's uh, May 2015, last summer. Um, we've gotten really, really good at monitoring this stuff. We have satellites, the Terra and Aqua satellites. Uh, we've got buoys out there that are measuring all this stuff. We're learning so much more. I mean, when I think of when I started into this profession 20 years ago, all we could do is speculate. Now we can actually measure this stuff. And it's pretty cool. Uh, the pitfall is just because you're measuring it for the first time doesn't mean it's the first time. Heard, okay, and this is we sometimes get off in left field on that, but just kind of gives you an idea of, of what's going on um, as far as ocean temperatures, and it's really been determined, and I think that's pretty robust science that these large bodies of water really mainly impact what kind of climate trend we're in and what our weather's going to be. I mean, you think of North America, and here's this huge body of water, and see, water has this unique quality it doesn't t change temperature easily. You have to put a lot of energy into it to change its temperature as opposed to air, okay? Uh, and that's, that's just why these bodies of water have such a huge impact because they're kind of like the steady rock and uh, the air is um, very temporary, easily changed, so. All right, and so uh, again, um, so what the uh, El Nino has done is it's created this big, this warm air right here has created this big low pressure up here, and low pressures uh, circulate counterclockwise in this type of fashion. So what's basically been happening is with that circulation, it tends to pull um, dry air masses over California and Nevada up into Montana, okay? So when we have this strong low pressure out here uh, that, the, uh, that the El Nino can create um, that parks right off the west coast there, we get California's weather, which doesn't have a lot of moisture in it, okay? Uh, so, and when we look at these types of patterns, here's the NOAA prediction. Um, this is uh, the an anomaly of, of uh, warm temperature in the northern Pacific uh, or in the Central Pacific, and what they're expecting right around now, February, March, is they're expecting this El Nino to weekend, and so by August through September, it's supposed to be either neutral or move into a La Nina phase, okay? Now this is really critical, and I'll, again, I'll emphasize that these NOAA predictions have gotten very, very good, okay? They're not infallible, but I've tracked these predictions for 20 years now, and really in the last five, six years, they've been right on. Okay, well I've been tracking them and, and they're pretty close. Now, you see all these scatter lines on here. These are all the different models. That's error. And so that's basically telling you that nobody really knows when this El Nino is going to break up. Hopefully pretty darn, darn soon. Because the sooner we go into this phase, the higher uh, probability that we're going to get rain this summer. Okay, and we're going to desperately need that in July and August to have those intermittent rainfalls just to wet stuff down, cool things off. But you can see there's one model that predicts that this is just going to continue on. And so, but the, the bulk of the predictions say sometime this spring or summer we're supposed to transition. So, some things to think about. Now, <clears throat> talk about El Nino, La Nina. What tends to impact us most is called Pacific Decadal Oscillation, okay? And that's actually North Pacific temperatures. And they don't always operate in sync with El Nino La Nina effects, okay? They do their own thing. And so this is uh, measured changes in general Pacific Decadal Oscillation Index. So um, hot, dry, cool, wet. And I'll refer to this a lot because this has had a huge impact on force across Montana and Idaho, the northern, northern Rockies, okay? And particularly I want to point out that from the 1940s, 
until the 1980s, we were actually in the longest cool wet stretch from the Pacific Decadal Oscillation that has occurred for over 400 years. Okay, that's really, really important, and I'll, I'll get into why that is. The other thing I want to emphasize here, and I'll emphasize this over and over again, we tend to look at trends as averages, straight lines, you know, that are averaged off of all this stuff. In nature and in ecological processes, nothing, uh, averages predict very little, okay? What is really, really important are the extreme hots and the extreme colds, because extreme drought will kill species and move them. Extreme cold will kill species and move them. Uh, I do a lot of windbreak and shelter belt work, and people are always experiencing or experimenting across central Montana. Well, grow here, and the famous one is the os tree. Okay, it says it's a it's a hybridized poplar uh, that can put on 10 feet of growth in one season. And in years like this, where we have mild temperatures, uh, it does really well. So in three years, you have a 30 foot tall tree. The problem is when it gets to 20 below, os trees die. Okay, so people are going cool. And then all of a sudden, we get a normal winter, average winter, where it drops to 40 below out in the haver. And the next spring, everybody's calling me, why are my trees dying? Well, because you planted shitty trees, OK? <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, I don't say that. But you know, it's, it's just one of those things you have to think about, OK? You but just say it politely. <laughs> I, I'd say, well, I, it, it, I ask, I, were they os trees? Uh, yeah, how did you know that, OK? <laughs> well, because they're not really suited for these extreme colds. And I experiment. I live up in Everill, okay? And every spring, Costco sells fruit trees at $10, $11 a tree, okay? Well, I'll tell you what, the pears grow really well, okay? But they sell uh, these cold resistant apricots. I've planted about uh, 10 of those damn things. Um, and they'll do great for a year or two, and then one winter, bam, and they're all dead, okay? Now, the nice thing Costco is I can take them back and they refund me my money. Uh, pretty, I keep waiting for them to say, no, 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 you've done this too many times already, okay? <laughs> but nonetheless, it's the, ext the point is it's the extremes that determine things, okay? It really is in the plant world. And again, I, I did my primary research work on little ponderosa pine seedlings that on this south-facing slope in the spring, it would be covered with ponderosa pine Douglas fir seedlings, and by August, they're all gone. And there are all sorts of theories floating out. Well, is deer eating them or turkeys eating them or whatever? Well, it's basically those soil surface temperatures got so blasted hot that the seedlings went into thermal shock and they basically got baked off the, the, the mountainside, except for ponderosa pine, that little seedling can, in one season, could not put a taproot down one meter. And that little seedling is pumping water like mad. And by pumping water, it keeps itself cool, and that's why it survives. And that's why that slope was dominated by ponderosa pine, even though you can get see all sorts of Douglas fir <coughs> seedlings in the spring, okay? So, okay, I've belabored that point enough. Uh, the variability is what's important, much more than the average. Okay, and so Pacific Decadal Oscillation, rather than equatorial, is Northern Pacific, and it's kind of counterintuitive because our warm phase is when the Northern Pacific is cold, and the cold air supports a low pressure that circulates counterclockwise, and as mentioned earlier with the El Nino effect, it tends to pull warm air from California up into Montana. That's our warm phase. Our cold phase is when the Northern Pacific is warm, which supports a high pressure that circulates clockwise, and it pulls cold air down from across Canada into Montana. And that's when we have a cold summer. Okay, so yes, it's oversimplified, but that's basically the way it works. And I, like I said, I track this stuff every year. And just by using those things, the, the El Nino, um, the uh, PDO indices and things like that, um, Personally, I have a pretty good track record of predicting what the summer's going to be like. Okay, not that I'm a genius. I just look at these things, and, and they kind of tell you, and, and Noah does the same. Now, if we take the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and we do the reconstruction from tree rings and everything else, uh, this is kind of what it looks like uh, over the last 350 years. And again, I mentioned this uh, 1940s to 1980s stretch. Okay, it's the longest cool wet stretch. We've had other ones in here. And I, I like to point out, who whoever read Little House on the Prairie? Okay. Fascinating historical book because they just recorded what happened. And remember that bad winter they had? And that, uh, the, the Indian who said every 13 years or something like that, we have this bad winter or something like that. So that took place right here. This was a little house in the prairie bad winter, okay, uh, when it occurred out there. 
So we have these, these fluctuations. And some people, if they look at the last 100 years, say it's a 30-year cycle. So there's 30 years, there's 30 years, there's 30 years. But you look at the longer thing, and it's kind of hard to see a pattern in there, OK? And so I don't, I don't again, if you want to create an average, it's great, but averages lie to you, OK? Um, PDO does what it does, and it's not always in sync with El Nino La Nina. When it is in sync with El Nino La Nina, we have summers like last summer, OK? When we had uh, a cold northern Pacific, a uh, warm El Nino, and that just exacerbated the hot air coming off of California. Quite often, California's weather is opposite of ours. When we're cool, wet, California's hot, dry. When California's cool, wet, we're hot, dry. But last year, and potentially this year, we're both in sync. And that leads to these mega fire years that we really got to think about. And when I did a historical overlay, those are bad fire years based on tree ring analysis uh, and fire scar analysis. So basically, 1802 was a bad fire year because we find ponderosa pine and larch and dug fir trees in western Washington and western Oregon and eastern Oregon and eastern Washington and Montana and Idaho that all show fire scars in 1802 telling us that most of the Northwest was on fire, therefore it's a bad fire year. When we throw those over on this weather or climate reconstruction, quite logically, when we have hot dry cycles, stuff burns, and when we have cool wet cycles, stuff does not burn, okay? So again, that should be kind of a no-brainer when it comes into this. But the other thing to, to look at is the longer the hot dry cycle, the more prevalent fires become because there's a delay effect. It takes a while for things to dry out. It takes a while for the soil to be depleted. And that's why I can make the comment that if this summer progresses like last summer, it's going to be worse because that soil last year really dried out and with this winter and early spring, it hasn't gotten the recharge. And uh, what's going on right now is it's at my house, it's uh, in the low 20s in the morning, and it's the mid 40s yesterday, 50s during the day. So what snow there is, is melting, but it's not soaking the soil because the soil is still frozen and it runs off on the surface. So we're not getting the soil <coughs> recharge, which just makes it even worse. And so when we get this cumulative drying effect, then every year it gets worse and worse and worse. And so that's why uh, this summer, if it continues in the trend we're on right now, uh, uh, really scares me. All right. So, um, you know, when we look at other aspects of historic, uh, historical things that happened, uh, W.H. Culver uh, was um, a surveyor, and he took a lot of pictures back then, which was hard to do. But this is the Judith Mountain, central Montana, near, near Lewistown. Um, and I always throw this one out, 1888. And this mountainside back here now, is that a grassland with some trees in it, or is that a forest with some grass in it, OK? I tend to say it's a grassland with some trees in it. And use these rocks right here as your, as your visual reference point, OK? They, they don't erode that quickly. And so now we move 100, year, 100 years into the future, boom, there's those rocks again. And now you look at that mountainside, and it's a forest with grass. Okay, but remember, water is the main thing. So we ask, what happened here? Now these pictures were originally used to show, oh, fire suppression. <coughs> we suppressed all these fires, and so we created this horrible scenario. Well, the reality is from the 1940s to the 1980s, it was cool wet. Fire suppression was easy, okay, and there weren't a whole lot of fires. Plus, we look at, okay, the bison are gone, uh, but we, we grazed a lot of this ground, and we grazed it pretty hard. Grass is a major comp competitor for tree seedlings. Uh, so we got rid of uh, perhaps grass competition, we had cool wet, and our forests have expanded quite a bit and gotten denser. Because the one thing that determines whether tree seedlings survive or not is water availability. And I'll, I'll show you uh, another study that, that kind of shows that. So we go back to our climate predictions. So when people develop all these indices and it's a little frustrating because you don't know what the heck the index is based on but uh, unless you get into their specific research so this is the water supply stress index which is a combination of evaporative demand soil water storage capacity and actually how much water is in that soil and so they come up with these rough maps of of where drought is at its worst and uh, of course california is, is right in there uh, maybe because it's more important than we are, but uh, uh, at least to the folks modeling this. But nonetheless, we can see that drought, uh, and this is approaching, this is, was created uh, end of 
2015. So this is where we are right now uh, based on this modeling effort. And it shows northern Idaho and western Montana is not really being uh, water stressed. Well, I can tell you that because the soils maps, and particularly the soils maps that show you anything about the water holding characteristics of soils in the mountains, are next to nothing. I mean, they're worthless. They're not, they're not there. It hasn't been done. Okay. So northwest uh, and north Idaho is kind of neutral on there, or low water stress, because basically they don't know. They don't have the numbers to model this. And again, this is why you have to be a little careful about these modeling efforts because the tendency would be to look at this and say, oh, well, the western uh, Montana, northern Idaho has nothing to worry about. No, it's they don't have sufficient data to model it, okay? We're in just as big a trouble as anywhere else is. Uh, uh, the value of this is that, yeah, drought is an issue right now, and you look at our past weather patterns, and it ought to be fairly evident. So let's look at the current NOAA predictions of where we are. Uh, this is temperature outlook, um, and I did this uh, uh, a month or two ago. So this was February prediction for 2016, where we were supposed to be in what's considered um, uh, 60 to 70 to 80 percent above normal temperature. Well, hey, they're pretty good. Okay, we're now at the end of February, and they were right on. We look at moisture uh, predictions also for February, and we're supposed to be below normal for moisture, somewhere in the 60% uh, uh, below normal. And yeah, they're right on, okay? So that's maybe the testing how good they are. So now if we look at this, um, um, this is for, uh, where's my month on here? February, oh, that, uh, February, February, March, April. Okay, so the predictions are that right where we're at, this, is, this was February, um, all the way through March, April, more of the same. Okay, so if you're waiting for that big snowstorm, we might get it, the snow just won't stick. Okay, it's still supposed to stay warmer. Um, again, not, not real well, not a real good prediction for this coming summer. And this was moisture, same, same time scale, below average moisture, and it's supposed to last. Okay, there is not a long-term prediction that we're going to make up for what we don't have now. We'll get some, okay? So again, <clears throat> I, I've gained a fair amount of confidence. They've been pretty on for the last five, six years, so that's a pretty good track record. So here we are, you know, um, if your property is now workable, maybe not with heavy equipment, but you can get out there and do stuff, do it now because um, I have a feeling summer's going to hit with a vengeance. Now, let's look at uh, the predictions all the way to February, March, April 2017. Uh, starting with where we are now, okay, so March, April, April, May, May, June, July, June, July, August, August, September, August, September, October, September, October, November 2016, October, November, December, so we're supposed to go neutral, and then November, December, January, more precip. I think it's precipitation. Yeah, temperature. Or temperature. Okay, it's going to get cooler. Thank you. <coughs> I thought I had a sequence. And then next winter is supposed to be a doozy. Lots of snow. Okay. Which means we need to survive until next winter. You know. And um, again, this is based on El Nino, La Nina, these general circulation models, things like that. Uh, the further out you get, the more uncertainty there is in this model. And for a while, they stopped producing these because they didn't want people yelling at them, you got it wrong, okay? But again, I found these pretty consistent, and this is the best we have. I mean, there's a lot of people, a lot of money going into this, uh, trying to figure this out. And so <coughs> I'm building a big wood pile for next winter because I heat with wood. Um, and for longer, and we'll get into that. So here's precipitation, okay? Same types of things. Um, there's not a lot of uh, moisture is considered neutral all summer long, not until October, November, December. Now, neutral basically means nobody knows, okay? There's just as many uh, predictions in favor of less moisture as there are predictions in favor of lower moisture, okay? <coughs> but again, next winter with more moisture, as that high and low pressure circulation, we're going to get more air <coughs> from the northern Pacific, from Canada, from Alaska, colder, more moisture, okay? So hang on till next winter. So, and uh, don't snow, sell your snowplow. Um, so those are, those are long-term predictions. And again, uh, 
having kind of tested and tracked these for the last uh, 20 years, in the last five, six years, they've been pretty close. So anyways, now you have kind of an idea of, of what the predictions are. So what does that mean in the overall scheme of things? I have, uh, as I mentioned, I have colleagues in the academic community that say, ah, global warming, global warming, global warming. You know, it's all proof of global warming, which it may well be. But for me, anytime you do any kind of research or studies of natural systems, which are complicated, there's lots of inputs and outputs on it. The first thing you do <coughs> as a good scientist is what is the natural variability in this system, okay? And you can't do predictions based on what's happened the last couple of years. You've got to see what's been going on for a long time. So this is a climate reconstruction, one of many, 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 but this is pretty close to the majority of them. That 10,000 years ago, we went from, the mini ice, or from a major ice age into what's called the Holocene. And initially, by the way, this is a log scale. So this is 10,000 years ago. This is only 2,000 years ago. So this is 8,000 years right in here, okay? This is the last 2,000 years. This from here on is the last thousand years, okay? And that's just to shrink the major trends into something that's, that's seeable. So the first 8,000 years, once we went into this warming period, we were actually warmer and drier than we have been the last uh, 800 years, okay? And I'll show you that there's been some great research looking at uh, pollen analysis. Our forests in northwestern Montana were sagebrush, open savanna, ponderosa pine with little pockets of dug for here and there. Okay, it was not what we see now, okay? And so we had a little bit of a cooling trend in here. Um, uh, <clears throat> so uh, kind of a mini ice age in there that lasted for about a thousand years. And then we had the medieval optimum. Okay, that's when the Vikings colonized Greenland and Iceland. And that medieval optimum warm period, and this is when Northern Europe agriculture flourished, okay? And then about 800 years ago, we went into what's called the mini ice age. That's when bubonic plague hit Europe because crop failures, everybody moved in the cities, everybody was starving, dirty, fleas, bubonic plague, and 75% of the European population died in the stretch, okay, because of that, that uh, mini ice age that occurred in there. Um, and then the mini ice age officially ended somewhere between 1920s and 1980s, depending on who you want to listen to and, and what measures you want to use. And here's where we are now, and this is the predicted global warming. So just use that as reference that, you know, uh, our temperature, our climate varies a lot. It has, okay? So this is kind of the background noise. And again, the failure with this graph is it's a simple average line for the entire northern hemisphere. <coughs> now, if we look at something a little closer, like the last 100 years uh, in southwestern Montana or northwestern Montana, and this is number of days where it's warmer than 32 degrees, which is about 80 degrees Fahrenheit outside. And so if we start in the 1900s, you can see that there's a gradual increasing trend in number of days that are warm. Okay? Steve Running and others show this as, a, as um, evidence and proof for global warming. Now we look at northwestern Montana, it's a lot more variable. Again, here's that 1940s to 80s in here. Um, a number of days that are warm, but really this 20-30 uh, year stretch in here, we had a series of hot summers in the early 60s. So there's that stretch in there, but um, you know, graphs and trends depend on where you cut off your data set. So if I were to extend this back out here, uh, you know, we might go up again, or if I exclude um, everything up to 1920s, then it's a pretty straight line, right? So data can be manipulated, but we certainly there's indication that there's a warming trend, but you see a lot of variability in here. I mean, this is just the line, but you know, you say, well, what happened here? Or what happened here? Well, there's 1910 right there when everything burned. Okay, it's that extreme that occurred. Well, thank you very much, appreciate it. Did you hear me coughing out there? No, I wasn't here. <laughs> oh, all right. <clears throat> and likewise, if we look at, uh, break it out uh, between maximum string, spring temperatures or maximum summer temperatures and minimum winter temperatures, okay? So in the spring, we see a slight increase that it isn't getting quite as cold. Um, it's maybe getting a little warmer. Um, winter, there's a slight trend there, but you know, you're really pushing it to put a straight line to that. It's a lot of variability in there, okay? So this trend is climate. <clears throat> 
This variability is weather. Okay, just to, to uh, re-emphasize that point. So yeah, we have been warming this last century. No doubt about it. The data is there. No arguments with that whatsoever. And now the question is, will we continue to warm or not? Now, I throw this one up here. This is a data set created for the Northern Hemisphere based on different studies uh, that have created this for different locations. And these lines are the different studies of uh, climate, depending where they were. The shaded is error associated with those averages. And what you'll see is, okay, not much error there because actually, you know, in the last 50, 100 years, we have actual records. These are all models or proxies based on tree ring analysis and uh, uh, bat poop in caves and coral formation and all those types of things. And you see there's a lot of error associated with that. But the other thing is, I pointed out the medieval optimum a thousand years ago, right here. But it might have been uh, pretty cold in Norway and was pretty warm in Canada. Okay, so again, just because we have these average tens, trends doesn't mean it's the same way everywhere. And this gets back to forestry is site specific depending on where you are. Okay, there's all these interacting high pressures and low pressures and climate trends and ocean currents. And so there's a lot of variability in here. And anybody who wants to say this is absolute the way it was um, doesn't know what they're talking about. Okay. We have these broad data sets, and depending where you were, certain things happened. Okay, and I get into arguments with, we have some political science uh, professors at, at MSU that want to definitively say this is the way it is and this is the way it isn't. And when I argue with them, they say, well, I'm, I'm just quoting the real science. And my response is, you don't understand the real science. Okay, and that there's a lot of variability in there. You can't say absolutes. You can just say there's these trends depending on the location you're in. So. Now, I just wanted to show you this study. <clears throat> Sorry for the complexity. I'll walk you through it real quickly. Okay. So this, these bars, uh, this is for the Black Hills. This was a comprehensive study in the Black Hills, which is this island mountain range out in the middle of the Great Plains. Okay. And it's there because the mountains cool the air and you get precipitation. These black lines are waves of ponderosa pine regeneration. Tree seed regeneration only occurs when you have a seed source, good cone crop, and you have enough moisture for those seedlings to survive for several years to develop a root system. Okay? When it's hot and dry, you may get seed drop, but none of them survive. Okay? Uh, so these are what they found is on the Black Hills. In this last 500 years, you get these pulses of regen. And I've seen and document the same thing across central and eastern Montana. And you can document the same thing across western Montana. It's just more complicated because the, the weather is more amenable. Uh, to trees growth, so you have to look at different species and their currents of regeneration. This <coughs> right here is the temperature uh, fluctuation over the Black Hills, uh, and, and specifically moisture, precipitation, so pre precipitation anomaly. So what this really shows is anytime we had a high moisture, well, we only got these, these seedling recruitment periods when there was high moisture. High moisture, high moisture, high moisture, high moisture. Now, we have other high moisture periods. What happened there? No seed source. A lot of rodents that year. Rodents can vacuum up every seed that drops if you're in a high rodent cycle. Okay? But the real thing in here is that when you have longer wet periods, you get these massive tree seedling recruitments. Okay? So when you look in eastern Montana, Custer National Forest, and, and uh, even on the CMR, you see these ponderosa pine forests. Well, I spent a lot of time out there coring trees. 90% of those trees are 70 years and younger. Okay, So those have only come in uh, here in the last uh, 50, 60 years. And particularly, Black Hills temperature or climate comes from the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, You put this one next to the Pacific Decay Law Oscillation, there's no correlation. Okay, And really, Pacific Decay Law Oscillation impact runs out of Great Falls. Really, it's drier at that point. So that's why it's a little different than what I've, what I've shown you on there. But this was really, and this is fire occurrence right here. And so the fires uh, occur when we have low precipitation, okay? So when it's dry, we don't get seedling recruitment. We have lots of fires. When it's wet, we get seedling recruitment and no fires. Perfect sense, right? It just, you don't have to have a PhD to understand any of that stuff. Uh, now, I throw this one in here too because this is the pollen analysis. This is Foy's Lake up in Kalispell. Okay, and so 
This is the last 13,000 years. And the cool thing about lake sediment is every spring, you get spring runoff, which means there's erosion, there's sediment that gets deposited. And in that sediment, pollen gets deposited. And pollen is unique. So you can determine the difference between Douglas fir pollen and ponderosa pine pollen, for example. You can't determine the difference between ponderosa pine pollen and uh, um, limber pine pollen, things like that. That's just pine in general. So what uh, <coughs> um, Kathy Whitlock was the main researcher in charge of this, they took these cores, they dated them based on things that they knew uh, occurred, and then they did pollen counts in there. So this is pine, the black here. So there's been a fair amount of pine in there since uh, the last ice age, which could be limber pine, could be ponderosa pine, could be white pine. Um, but what's really cool, Pseudosuga and Larch is right here. And you look at the width of this, tells you how much pollen there is, OK? The gray is just uh, five times to exaggerate the trends in there. But what I thought was really cool, you think of Kalispell. What do you think about the forest up there? Fairly dense, fairly productive, dominated by Douglas fir, right? Douglas fir was a minor component until 2,000 years ago up in Kalispell, OK? Do you think of Kalispell Valley as a sagebrush valley? I certainly don't. Sagebrush is Artemisia, right here. Well, here's 2,000 years ago. We go back from 2,000 years ago all the way to 13,000 years ago, sagebrush was a very common uh, element in the understory there. Okay, so, and uh, you can also do, this is total pollen accumulation, but they also do fire on here. This is fire frequency based on the amount of charcoal uh, in the soil. And what you really see is, about 2,000 years ago is a real uptick in fire frequency, which is probably a, a pretty good indication of Native American activity burning up there. Okay, um, Because we actually got wetter because of the Douglas fir, but we got an increase in frequent fire, which means somebody had to be starting those fires because it's cooler and wetter. Okay? So this is really cool stuff. She's done this for uh, a dozen lakes all across Montana and parts of Idaho, soft tooth range. And we see these massive species shifts um, in the last 10,000 years, okay? So to me, this was some of the most relevant research I've ever seen, because I've been studying the geography of tree species across the Northern Rockies for a long time. And what it really, really tells us is that things can change pretty quickly based on climatic trends, okay? We, and the other big aha moment is when you look at this even, even more closely is the forests that we see now have only existed and operated the way they do for perhaps the last 800 years. They haven't been there for 10,000 years. Okay, so think about that. What's 800 years to a forest? Okay, average tree age before it dies is going to be 200 to 300 years. That's four or three generations of trees. That's all. Okay, so if we think of these forests and the complex interaction between species that are out there as these highly evolved, highly adapted, co-evolved systems, it ain't true, okay? There's a bunch of stuff that was here, and based on the current climatic trend, it just kind of assembled itself based on convenience and seed source, okay? So, and what I get to here is the myth that anything you do to your forest is gonna upset this highly complicated, highly evolved network. It isn't, our forests are incredibly robust because with all this change that's been going on, they're still here, and when things change, the species just reassemble themselves differently, okay? So that's what we really have to be looking at as forest managers uh, to understand this whole thing. So, okay, back from that to our overall climatic prediction. So these are projections based on global warming models up until 2070, and so if you look at California, for example, down here, uh, where uh, this is percent change in moisture and temperature. You can see that they're predicting uh, right now um, less moisture, actually severely less moisture. Uh, here's uh, parts of uh, southern Oregon. Here we are, right here in uh, uh, northern Rockies, eastern Washington, or the Milk River. And what you see is the climate predictions say more moisture is in the long-term forecast. So if you read the papers and everything, everybody's predicting we're getting warmer and drier, and we're going to turn into uh, a, a desert wasteland or forest. Though interestingly enough, the global warming model predictions say we're going to get wetter. 
up here as far as long-term trends. Now, I can't attach any confidence to any of this stuff because I haven't done the modeling. Um, I, 30 years ago, I was involved in testing some of the uh, um, models, the BGC models, uh, in my postdoctoral studies, and I found uh, them to be very good relative models. That means if I change sunlight, I can see how everything else is going to change. If I change moisture, I can see how everything else is going to change. Where those models are horrible is in predicting absolutes. When they're there to predict, just like with our tax model, which is based on the same modeling, when they're predicting how well a tree will grow in any specific location, they were less than a crapshoot. Okay, I'd be better off flipping a coin on them. So just so you're aware, there's a difference between understanding comparisons between things and understanding absolutes. All right, so what about the sun? I, that's ignored a lot, but I, I also study solar physics uh, quite a bit. Um, so um, this is something I've been tracking for a long time just because the sun is the biggest influence on our climate and our climatic trends. And you know, this is a, shows the gravitational fields on the sun. It's not this uniform uh, homogenized ball of energy that throws uh, light in our direction. There's all sorts of stuff going on in the sun. Um, and one of them is they call it a conveyor belt. It's the circulation of plasma from the poles up to the uh, equator. And when that does certain things, it gives us certain predictions about what's going to happen because the sun actually pulses. And it pulses on an 11 to 13 year cycle. Okay? And what these are is uh, the blue is sunspot observations, um, the green is solar flares, um, the black line, well, no. The, the yellow is irradiation. And the sun puts out what's called the solar constant. It's called the solar constant because on average it doesn't vary very much. And the solar constant is 13,066 uh, uh, watts per square meter per second that it puts out. And you think of it as a big light bulb, okay? We can all envision a 60 watt light bulb, things like that, okay? So <clears throat> it consistently puts out this kind of energy. But when you look at the solar pulses, just like in ecological measurements, averages are dangerous numbers, right? Well, here's our average, but look at these variances in here, okay? So, um, 1990s, you know, we were really getting some serious stuff coming off the sun there. And yeah, it's only two watts per square meter per second, which seems minuscule compared to the over amount there. But think, two watts is a thousandth of a percent. <coughs> somewhere in there, CO2 is increased by one-tenth of a percent, and that's the major greenhouse gas, okay? So these things are interconnected, and I'll show you more. So here's, our, here's the Earth. Uh, again, just to put things into bigger perspective, all that water that's absorbing that energy, and as you know, when you're applying energy to a pot of water, there's a delay effect. It takes a while for that water to absorb that energy, and that's why when we see these inputs and outputs, and then the actual climatic impacts, they're always delayed afterwards, okay? We get these cumulative effects. But to put it in perspective, when you think, okay, what's one or two watts per meter squared per second more or less? I mean, it really, is it, is it even, does it even register on a radar? Well, let's put the Earth to scale to the sun, and this is a solar flare. This is the Earth to scale to the sun and solar flare, okay? It suddenly changes a little bit of our perception of what the impact of the sun is on the Earth, okay? Which is also in the International Space Station, they have a special room they go into, because if there's a solar flare that hits the space station, all the astronauts in there are gonna fry, okay? And they have that special room in there where they can go into uh, so they don't get a, a million, million dose radar or X-ray uh, that they would if they weren't out there, okay? I did, again, some interesting little uh, things in there. So. The solar physicists who study the sun have noticed a very pronounced conveyor belt effect in the sun, which always precedes a quiet period in the sun. And so uh, these are actual measurements on that 13-year cycle of where we're at. This is now 2014, 20, 2016. And what they're seeing is these peak periods are declining quite a bit. And before that decline occurs, you get this massive outburst of black hole, uh, not black hole, sunspots and solar flares, okay? That almost always precedes a quiet period. And to put that into perspective, here's the last 400 years of solar output. Um, and you can measure that by beryllium and things like that. 
uh, on geologic substrate. And we have two uh, really quiet periods called the Maunder Minimum, based on the people who figured it out, and the Dalton Minimum. Okay? And this is when things got really cold on the Earth. Severe winters, cool summers. Okay? So these are, are well documented in the scientific literature. And then you look at where we are here. I mean, we just came off of a 40 year stretch of some serious solar output. And those high solar outputs almost always precede a minimum period. So what the solar physics journals are now indicating is, again, this is uh, uh, telling us the same thing. And by the way, this blue line, this is solar output. This blue line is global average temperature. And again, you see there's a pretty good correlation with sun's energy and climate, uh, global climate as well. And so what they're seeing now is solar output. We're down here. And there are predictions, based on the strength of these measurements on the sun, that we're going to get down to a Dalton, some even predict a maunder minimum of solar energy again. So we're going to go here. So what's going to happen to global temperature? Okay. Now, I am not refuting greenhouse gas theory and global warming theory. There are many things that are affecting our climate. <coughs> Uh, the physics behind greenhouse gases is there. It's a lot more complicated than people would like you to believe because you get these bubbles of CO2 and they have different thermal characteristics and uh, it, it's not nearly as simple as some people would like to uh, point out. And I get really irate when someone says, the discussion is over. You just have to accept and believe, okay? Well, that's religion. That's not science, okay? Um, so the discussion isn't over. There is good physics behind greenhouse gas impacts, okay? So, and we may be having a warming impact. We probably are having a warming impact from greenhouse gases. The question is, how much? And how is that going to interact with <coughs> this trend? And as I mentioned uh, <clears throat> at another talk, you know, if, whoop, I got to go back. I went the wrong way, but, uh, and I don't know how to get back. Oh, well. <laughs> if we do now, uh, this prediction from solar physics is that it's going to reach its minimum in 2025. Okay, so that's the other reason I'm building the wood pile from, from a big wood pile. Okay, let's put it that way. Because uh, next winter is supposed to be cold. And so what's really going to be interesting now, and as I told my colleagues, we're going to see this impact of solar decline with impact of greenhouse gases, and the next 10 years can be fascinating. Because if we continue to warm, that adds a lot of evidence and credence to the global warming theory with greenhouse gases. On the other hand, if we get cooler, there's going to be a lot of scrambling going on. Okay? So, what am I doing? I'm building a big wood pile because, hey, if I don't need to use it, fine. But if it's cold and everybody's suddenly scrambling for wood, that's the wrong time to be getting it. Okay? I'm getting it now. I want to have five years of wood uh, for my house. And so, we'll see what happens. Okay? Now, to bring it back down to the reality of, whoop, gosh, um, the reality of things, I really need to know how to reverse these. Um, all right, so under the current situation, we've had a low pressure down here that's circulating air up across California. As this changes to a La Nina, we're more likely going to have a high pressure up here, and we're going to be getting this Canadian cold air. This is the conflict that we always deal with. This is what impacts Northern Rockies uh, climate and weather a lot. I just want to back up there a second. And so now let's go after this big theoretical discussion about you know, how, the, how the sun and the earth and all this stuff goes and how the world's going to end, what does that mean for us here uh, on an applied scale? So most of our moisture, of course, comes from the Pacific air across here. Uh, depending on the highs and the lows and La Nina's, we get this in significant infl influence from Nevada and California. So it's really a lot is determined how much is this influence and how much is that influence and the jet stream and all of that. We also get some cold air coming from the Arctic. Uh, and if you're in Haver in January, I happened to be out there doing a windbreak workshop once and it was 40 below out. I mean, as they say in Haver, nothing between us and the North Pole but a picket fence, and that day it was true. Um, but this has a huge influence because this moves in pretty quickly and brings wind storms along with it. Shoto, three times a year, gets 80 plus mile an hour winds because of these, these big weather changes. And then Gulf air masses, this is what impacts the Black Hills. But it also impacts eastern Montana and half of Yellowstone National Park. Yellowstone National Park is kind of split between influence from here and influence from there. It's pretty cool stuff. Interesting. You can see the fires on that. 
This is this is an old one. This is a Fridley fire when it was burning. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. <clears throat> and uh, Moose fire. Yeah. 2001. Yeah. yeah. So, anyways, yeah, it's an, I like this one, so I, you know, I get a new one. Um, anyways, but when we look at these impacts, to the left of this red line, we get we have uh, ponderosa pine, grand fir, subalpine fir, white pine, larch. Uh, this is our wet productive forest. Okay, North Idaho is this is largely cedar grand fir forest habitat types. We get to the right of this, our wettest forest type is Doug fir, uh, snowberry, sometimes Doug fir, nine bark. So we get this real dividing line, and this should actually go down to, down to there, but we get this dividing line be between weather influences, okay? And so last year, of course, this area got hit really hard by the drought, and that's why it burned. Uh, out here, yeah, it burned, but by golly, we're used to it now, okay? And we're ready for it. So just, you know, th there's these big impacts. So if we look at how bad is the drought, let's bring it down to, okay, what can I do? And now that, you know, I've been dazzled and overwhelmed by all this global stuff, okay? So topographic position in soils, northwestern Montana, it's in that wet zone, okay? And you get localized effects, because as these air masses hit a mountain, they raise up, they cool, and they drop precipitation, condensation. And when they come over the mountaintop, they no longer have moisture, so as they move in the valley bottoms, they recompress, but because they don't have that moisture as a buffer, they heat at a faster rate than they cooled. Prime example is Lolo Pass. I mean, you go over to Powell, you're in cedar forest types. You get over up on top of uh, Lolo Pass, by the time you're down in Lolo, you're in Ponderosa Pine Forest, okay? And that's simply because of this compression and moisture and condensation effect. All right, so, you know, here's our grand fir forest because it gets more moisture. Multi-story, grand fir, shade tolerant grows in the understory. You got larch, ponderosa pine, all that stuff in there. You move out of, and subalpine forests as well, deep snow packs, okay. Subalpine uniquely designed to shed snow, but also trap sunlight so it can actually start photosynthesizing when there's still snow on the ground. It's a, it's a solar collector, all right. Lodgepole pine associated with that. Lodgepole pine is its own unique ecosystem. You have these lodgepole pine stands where they burned. Okay, because logical pine to develop this kind of stand needs to burn. Serotonous cones release the, re releases the seeds. You get into central Montana and you get these dug fir um, forests. Now we're out of the Pacific influence. We're in that California influence, Gulf of Mexico influence. And so you have tree lines on the bottom and tree lines associated with aspect, south slope, north slope. So dug firs on these eyebrows on the northeast sides of things. These forest exists on this very, very narrow margin of error, okay? So the, the grand fir forest, same thing, only what you see is grand fir start dying at a massive scale. Not as evident, because grand fir is always dying for one reason or another, but on these forests, Douglas fir forests, when they fail, they can fail big time, okay? And I'll get more into that. And then the, the dry dug fir, mixed ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, you don't have brush on the understory. Um, and the effects of aspect, okay? This is uh, um, south of um, Anaconda <coughs> um, in the uh, valley between the tobacco roots um, and the pintlers. And so this spot right here gets the same amount of moisture as that spot. The only difference is here, the sun evaporates a lot of it. And on this side, it makes in the soil. So you have Douglas fir, Douglas fir here, uh, juniper, uh, mountain mahogany there, dug fir, juniper. So aspect makes a big difference. And again, back to the point, forestry site specific. If you just draw a line on an elevational side here, well, you're gonna fail there and you're gonna fail there because if you're trying to do an average type of management in there, neither, neither of them is specific to the site. And then the dry ponderosa pine forests, okay, that we have. And these are all determined by the moisture and temperature gradients, humidity that's in there. And out, and uh, a, a German climatologist kind of developed this over 100 years ago called Walter, and he developed the climate atlases, Walter and Leith, where basically, um, if here we are in Astoria, Oregon, fewer places that are wetter, this is precipitation, this is temperature, and maybe first week in August, we might have a week where the air is warmer, warm enough to absorb more moisture than exists to evaporate into that moisture, okay? We call this the drought period, 
Now, we look at Salt Lake City, which is analogous to most of Montana. You can see that uh, June, July, August, September, our temperature and the air's capacity to absorb moisture is much higher than the moisture availability, and so this is summer drought. Okay? You get over to Fargo, North Dakota, Midwest, Wisconsin area, that's where I grew up. The humidity is always unbearable, okay? <laughs> because the air never exceeds the moisture, uh, the ability of the vegetation and the site to give moisture off. And we'll get frequent, ra frequent rain during the summer, okay? So these, this is really what defines where trees go and how well they grow, is how long is this low humidity drought period. That determines what trees grow where and how well they grow across Montana, okay? And that can be somewhat moderated by soil because <clears throat> when you're not getting moisture, the humidity is low and the air is sucking the moisture out of the trees, the only way the trees are gonna get enough water is that water stored in the soil. So if we look at, this is a typical Mount Mazama ash cap soil in North Idaho. It's wonderful stuff. It's just, just this big pumice sponge. It has no nutrients because it's just volcanic glass, but it holds water, okay? So that's kind of what it looks like. It's the best growing medium in the world. In some places, <coughs> it's 10 yards deep, okay? And that's why on a ridge top, you can have this kind of forest. This is Western Red Cedar, grown on a ridge top in North Idaho, just out there by Clarkia, east of, uh, east of Moscow, Idaho, okay? It's just this beautiful sponge that holds all that snow melt and all that water. Now let's move over to central Montana, okay? The biomass is the same, okay? But when you look at the soils, you get road cuts, I always look at road cuts, that's your soil, okay? You got four to six inches over rock, okay? And this is just to show it at the extremes of the impact that soil can have. So on your property, if you're noticing slower growth or drought stress in trees, things like that, your soil varies a lot. You have one big tree that's growing gang gangbusters. You ever wonder, why is that tree growing so well? That might be just a dip in the rock or a crack where that tree has its root system to enough water. It's all about water, and soil is this huge buffer towards that. So when you ask me, well, how bad is the drought stress? What species do you have? Where are you on the mountaintop? How deep is your soil? that can have a huge impact, okay? And so when we look across the landscape, this is Flesher Pass, and you see, why are those trees green? Why is this one green and these defoliated by spruce budworm? Why is this patch green and that patch green? And look at all that stuff, okay? It's water, okay? And we'll go into it even in greater detail. Water availability and soil impacts will vary by species. This is a Ponderosa pine root system. Okay, this is a Douglas fir root system. Okay, so which one in a drought period is going to be drought stress first? The Douglas fir will, because it is drawing its water, let me go one more, it is drawing its water from the upper foot of soil. Whereas a ponderosa pine next to it has tap roots that have found some crack in the rock and those roots go down God knows how many meters, and it's pulling, it's sucking water out of some cistern, natural cistern that's in the soil. And if it can't find that, or the longer you're in drought, at some point it's going to run dry. And that's when Ips, western pine beetle, mountain pine beetle are going to hit it. Okay? So, let's move right into species and genetic adaptation. This is a 411 year old <coughs> large slice taken off the back of my property. 13 fire scars until 1888 when the Native Americans were moved off into reservations and they didn't burn anymore. Okay? Tree continued to grow. It was logged in 1910, or around that area, era. This is not growth response. This is that tree was left alone because it had this cat face and cull, and if you're cutting these things with a misery whip, you're not going to cut a tree down that has cull wood in it, right? So it was left. It was left alone. Big opening around it with other trees. So the tree started doing this in the wind, and the tree responded by building compression wood at the base to stabilize the tree. That's what that is. I've had a lot of foresters and loggers say, see, these old trees do respond to thinning. So, well, let's look six feet up. No response visible. OK? 
Okay? It's just compression of the flare, the butt flare you see on there, which is cool as well. So, all right. The way trees work is uh, the growth is underneath the bark in the cambium, um, and that cambium puts a layer of sapwood to the inside and a layer of what's called phloem tissue to the outside. The sapwood's purpose is to conduct water up to the top, right? The phloem tissue is to move sugar water that the needles produce down to the rest of the tree to feed it. And at some point, the, the, how much sapwood they have is dependent on how, what their needle is, area is and what their water demand is. The more water demand they have, the more sapwood there is, but there's a price. Sapwood is alive, so you have to feed it to keep it alive. So the width of the sapwood is always proportional to the tree's vigor. If it has uh, enough energy to feed its sapwood, it can get more water and photosynthesize more. If it doesn't have energy to feed its sapwood, it's going to let it die, and that becomes the heartwood in here. Okay? So there's this, this balance that's in place. And any obstruction in the sapwood, this happens to be uh, um, an aspen, but it was a good demonstration. Uh, here's the sapwood right here. Okay? This is the part that's conducting water up. This is a dead branch, a stob in there, and so the sapwood is always under suction in the summer because that water is being pulled out of the leaves. It's like a straw. We call it the pipe straw theory of how water gets moved up. Okay? As soon as you have an injury in that sapwood, it's like poking a hole in the straw, you get an air pocket or air embolism in there. It doesn't conduct water anymore. This twig died. Air got pulled in here. This part of the sapwood is non-functional, which means it's an obstruction to moving water up to the top again. This is why pruning is really important that you don't have open wounds in a tree, okay? Because this is what happens anytime you ding the bark. This is what happens in a tree's ability to move water up to the needles. Needles don't get enough water. They don't photosynthesize, not enough energy. You don't get growth, okay? So, and this is the hardwood in here. And right under here, this thin layer in here is where all the sugar gets moved down, okay? For the sugar to move down, first water has to move up, okay? Very, very important concept in all of this stuff. Here's a grand fir that I topped because it, it got the top got hit by uh, um, um, fir beetle, fir and graver beetle. And you can see here's the sapwood because I left these branches. I was experimenting. If I take off half the foliage of the tree, will the tree stay alive? Because grand fir on my property runs out of moisture and they just fail catastrophically. They just die. So I topped this tree because I wanted to keep it there as a shade or an ornamental. And my wife hated it. So, oh, it looks ugly, but it's an experiment. Okay, so it grew 10 years after I topped it because it had less water demand, lower foliage content. Okay, it was a strategy that I prescribed to windbreaks and shelter belts where it's really dry. So you can see the sapwood that was added right up to where this branch is because that sapwood has to be fed. It gets its energy growth from these branches. And where there's no more growth, of course, it dies back. And, well, <clears throat> see all sorts of other interesting things going on, but just kind of demonstrate how that works. So we go back to, here's a 411 year old larch. Young trees with a full crown are all sapwood. We call that bull pine. If you're trying to sell ponderosa pines, all sapwood. At some point, when they get older, they start putting on heartwood. This heartwood has all sorts of valuable characteristics for wood products industry. It's decay resistant, all those types of things. It's dead, okay? The older a tree gets, the less efficient it gets. Photosynthesis slows down. It's not quite understood why. But you can see how much sapwood there is. That sapwood is proportional to how much crown there is. The older a tree gets, the less efficient it gets. It gets to the point where it's just in maintenance mode. It's not actively growing anymore. Okay? Another important part of physiology. Big old trees are much more delicate to climate change or drought than younger robust trees. Okay? It's just the way it is. Some people will say, no, that's not the case. But the big old growth tree stuff you get is from research on coastal Oregon, coastal Washington, Jerry Franklin's work. It is an entirely different forest ecosystem than Northern Rockies. Okay? They don't not they're not comparable. All right. So I just make that statement in there. Now, a researcher here at University of Montana, Anna Sala, did some really cool research because she was there, there's there's always this discussion. Do trees die during drought? Because they're shutting down, they're shut down, they can't photosynthesize. So they don't produce enough sugar, so they die of starvation, right? Makes sense. Or do they just die from drought stress? You know, not, not enough water, they just, physiology stops. What happens? So what she started doing is measuring carbohydrate concentrations, sugar, starch in the trees at different levels. And what she found here is <clears throat> this 
is at 57 meters up in a ponderosa pine tree. This is at two meters off the ground. And what you found here is there are natural variations in the spring, carbohydrate and winter. Trees store carbohydrates, so in the spring they can grow no, no needles. But what you also found is when the tree goes in drought stress, the carbohydrate loading in the top of the crown becomes much, much greater, much higher. Because the trees don't have the water to move the sugars from the top of the crown down the stem into the root system anymore. Okay, it's a plumbing system. You run out of water, it doesn't circulate anymore. So trees do have a circulatory system. And you know th this is different than broadleaf trees, and I could spend hours on this, I won't. Um, but here's spruce, and what you found is that the carbohydrate loading um, normally in a tree is, is high right before the, the needle uh, flush, as we would expect April right here and here. But when um, trees start getting stressed, like here, uh, here's a spruce, in June or July, uh, the carbohydrate loading starts to pile up in the top of the crown because the tree photosynthesizes, but it can't transport those sugars down to the stem and the root system. If we go by height and carbohydrate loading, what you see on dry versus wet year. Wet years are open circles. So wet years, the carbohydrate uh, loading um, on the top of the tree and the bottom of the tree stay pretty much in sync. Okay, as more sugars get produced top, they get moved down. In dry years, this is height at 40 meters, we get this storage of sugars and starches in the top of the tree because the tree can't move them down because of water stress. So you're asking, okay, well, I'll just skip that. Why is that important? <coughs> Well, defoliators, spruce budworm, bark beetles, fungal pathogens do not eat wood. They cannot break down cellulose, they cannot break down lignin. What they're after is the sugar that's in the tree. So when a tree is suffering from drought stress, basically you get this big lollipop on the top of the tree with a dinner bell associated to it saying, hey, I have all this sugar and starch that you want to eat in the top of my tree and I don't have the water pressure to move it or the water pressure to push pitch to defend myself. So with drought, trees become much more nutritious and much more palatable to insects and diseases. Okay, So that's actually what's going on out there. And so when you're looking at the top of a tree and you say, oh, okay, what bug is chewing on this? I get a lot of questions. How do we fight mountain pine beetle? How do we fight western pine beetle? How do we fight spruce budworm? What you're dealing with is drought stress. The beetles and the bugs and the caterpillars are only telling you where that drought stress is occurring. Okay, so I compare these two trees. Well, this one is evidently getting enough water. This one is not. So it's becoming a highly susceptible tree to bugs and diseases. And worse is as those particularly beetles build up population, once you get mega populations, they can start attacking healthy trees because by sheer number, they can overcome the defenses of the trees. So we really need to start looking at our trees, not as what insect or disease is out there, but how drought stressed are they, okay? This is the precursor to everything because these trees, and ponderosa pine, you know, it likes to hit the top. Well, no brainer. This is where all the goodies are, okay? Right here, <clears throat> you're eating at McDonald's and starving, and right here, you're eating at Jaker's. Okay, so that's kind of what's going on out there. So when we assess our crowns, whoop, dang it. Oh, there we go, I figured it out. Okay, when we assess the crowns, what we're seeing here is this tree is drought stressed and can't move its carbohydrates, so it's this super food for bugs. And that's why we want to get it out of there. And likewise, when we change the environment on a tree, dug fir, common, you know, we do these sea tree and shelter woods, we're changing this whole water balance because now this was shaded, maximum summer temperature was maybe 70 degrees. Now in the full sunlight, it's getting 150 degrees. The soil is getting hot. Those fine root system, that shallow root system of the duck fir is getting cooked. And because of that, it can't suck enough water and you start seeing this crown decline on Douglas fir. Now you can get away with it on north and east slopes because it's not direct sunlight on the soil there. But on south and west slopes, you do that to your dug fir, you're asking for trouble, okay? Because you're changing that water balance on there. So, drought stress, how bad is it? Well, it depends. Now we're on that final thing. Depends what you do. You can influence by manipulating canopies um, how much water is available. And we see this in natural patterns. Big old trees are not able to survive these stresses as much because they're not photosynthetically efficient. 
They've kind of reached this super height where they have to transport water all the way up to the top of the tree in a drought stress situation. They're the first ones to go out. Okay, I'm going to just skip past a lot of things. So solutions, what can we do? Uh, another thing I've been studying for many, many years is uh, snowpack dynamics and water dynamics. Uh, so this time of year, I get up in a lot of places because I'm really interested in snow, snow patches. And so here's a Douglas fir forest. Uh, um, I took this in April. Not much snow left, pretty dense forest. This is a little patch in the canopy. There's actually a foot and a half of compacted snow in there. Okay, and so I've been looking at this. This is a dense canopy, thinned area. Okay, this is particularly valuable again on north and east slopes where the direct sun doesn't hit that snowpack, but the whole point is to let the snow get to the ground and not get hung up in the canopy. And you know, I'm a hunter, I'm a hiker. Uh, middle of winter, I will go out, place where I hunt, and in end of November, there's three feet of snow on the logging roads. And everybody's slogging through the feet, three feet of snow. I step in the timber, and there's six inches of snow, and I'm five miles up the road before those people are half a mile down the road. Okay, works real well for me. I always get my elk. Okay, but, um, Managing snowpack is something that we really need to consider. And actually, there's a, a, a scientist, uh, Trendle is his name, who in the 70s and 80s started studying this. And this was a design he did strictly to measure snowpack differences based on openings and canopies. And he did some great work in all this stuff. And we had to rediscover some of this. We did something similar on the Tenderfoot Forest out in central Montana. And uh, well, I'll tell you what the problems were. Keep that. What he found is on some of these studies that this is snowpack or snow water equivalent, uh, in some of them it didn't change very much because snow dep deposition is not only interference, it's also wind movement, all right? And so what he found is when he creates these corridors, like we did in Tenderfoot, they create corridors for the forest. The wind goes in there and blows all the snow out of the corridors, okay? So we don't see an impact of the opening. On the other hand, if you create what he called later on honeycomb forest, rather than a forest with channels through it, a forest with pockets in it, then you keep that snowpack on site. So the whole point is to create a honeycomb type of effect. And like I said, I do a lot of windbreak and shelter belt work. The only way we get these trees to grow out here where there's 11 inches of precip in the summer is we create a barrier that collects a snow drift and that snow drift waters this windbreak and shelter belt all summer long. Well, it, it obviously it melts but it creates a water pool because trees don't naturally occur until you get a minimum 16 inches of rainfall a year or precipitation or 11 inches. So we have to create the equivalent of at least 16, preferably 20 inches of snowfall. And there's, there's, all of this has been studied pretty carefully. And so here's some other studies that were done. And on some of them, so this is Lexan Creek. This is before harvest, this is after harvest, okay? they doubled or tripled snowpack and water equivalent in a lot of these places. And I'm just going to skip over a lot of this. Here's another, this is a giant watershed where they did a comparative. One where they did nothing, one where they did something. And so what they found is May, the difference is the shaded here, you got this much bigger snowpack. On average, 11 to 15 percent more water equivalent on the site. And when they measured, and they measured stream flumes, okay, they put gates on streams, during the summer, these are rainfall events up here, okay? So a minimal impact of rainfall events, but you think about it. In the summer, soils have dried down. It rains a quarter of an inch, it makes it into the soil. It never makes it to the stream. You don't measure the stream outflow, okay, unless you're interested in trout. So here, water's being supplied, but trees are reusing that. And I can show you other data that really shows trees do respond to those events, if it's enough. A quarter inch in the middle of summer does next to nothing for the tree. Most of it evaporates back, okay? And then uh, August, uh, late, later in the season, when you start getting consistently longer periods of rainfall, you started to see more stream flow recovery. So I've looked at a lot of the studies they did, as well as there have been a, a bunch of other studies that looked at this in the Nez Perce and, and, and other places. Uh, this was a real complicated one where we looked at, where they looked at, uh, this is prior to any, any harvesting on the drainage. Then they put in a road network, and so this is change in, uh, in water flow in the streams, and you saw an in, uh, changes because of the roads collecting water. And then they put in different harvesting treatments, and you start to see this, this uh, really um, 
20 to 30 percent change in water yield out of the drainage because of the types of harvesting treatment. Now, any harvesting will not improve the snowpack and water yield. It has to be designed specifically for the site you're on. And again, on average, you can expect 11 to 12 percent increased water availability if you manage for snowpack. Much, much more depending on the site you're on. Okay? And so we get to, okay, what kind of openings do I want to create? From strictly a wind perspective, uh, here's some opening size studies I did where this is times the tree height on the adjoining stand. So when we're, the opening is only a quarter of the size width as the trees are tall, you saw minimal impact of snow accumulation. When you got to half an inch, three quarters, one times, so drop a tree, that's the size of your opening, you got maximum impact of snow packed on that side. And that impact would last it all the way out to about an opening no more than five times as wide as the adjoining trees are tall. <coughs> now this is going to vary by aspect. On a south and west slope, okay, the summer uh, zenith is at 66 degrees here. Okay? On a south and west slope, if you create an opening this size, you're going to get sunlight directly into that opening and it's going to melt your snowpack off. So it's counterintuitive. On a south and west slope, your openings need to be smaller so you get shading effect to keep that snowpack. On a north and east slope, where you don't get that direct sunlight in there, you can go bigger. Okay? But optimal is somewhere between one to five times the height of the surrounding trees is optimal opening size for collecting snow. And interestingly enough, this is exactly the same physics we use for windbreaks and shelter belts. If you're trying to protect your house, you calculate how big the trees are going to get on your windbreak or your shelter belt. Your leeward protection zone, maximum protection zone from the, from the wind, is five times the leeward distance as the height of your windbreak or shelter belt. It's a formula we use for planting windbreaks and shelter belts. So the beauty is that as things, you know, at different venues of research show the same thing, it adds validity to the research and the recommendations. So here's another one where, where they did diameter of the clear cut uh, as multiple times the height of the trees, and so 10 times, you know, you still got an impact, but a lot depends on the wind. Central Montana wind is going to be much more powerful than up here in northwestern Montana, and where you are in the valley, etc. Forestry is site specific, so if you haven't noticed a lot of wind, you know, you can do your openings bigger if you want to, but at least a quarter as big as the trees are tall. So, and I just use this example, this is up where I live, every quarter, and not that this was designed to do this. Um, the tribal forestry was based on historic recollection of elders of what these forests used to look like. Plus, these larch in the fall are telling you where the past fire patches were. Okay, larch only little seed will only regenerates well on disturbed soil, fire or logging with soil disturbance. Okay, this is the larch established here before logging, so those larch are past fire patches that burn black, uh, openings in in there. And what the tribe uh, did on there is, is creating a lot of openings in there. Well, inadvertently, or maybe by planning, they are increasing water yield because they're creating these patches that collect water. And I'm up there hiking all the time. I was just up there yesterday. And in the openings, there's still three feet of snow. And under the trees, there's none. Okay. So what is that going to buy you? It might buy you one to three weeks. Well, that's huge because the longer trees are shut down from water stress, the more that sugar gets dammed on the top of the tree, the more susceptible they are to insects and diseases. So, you know, this is how this all comes together. I mean, it's, sorry, it, it, it's a long story. There's lots of players in all this. Climate, uh, topography, all those things you've got to think about. So when you're doing this kind of stuff, and here's just an example up on Flesher Pass, this area had been treated before this bruise budworm outbreak came in play. What is the difference between these trees and these trees? Well, there's genetic variability, but there's a greater percentage of trees here that are looking well and growing well and not impacted by spruce bloodworm than there out, are out here. Okay? And some of it is water availability. These guys can move their carbohydrates around and they can use them for de defense mechanisms. Now this is hotter, a little, maybe a little windier, which spruce bloodworm also doesn't like, so it's kind of a, a double additive effect. It, nothing is as simple as it may appear. So, this long story has now come to an end, just in time 
for you to move on pretty soon to move on to something else. So questions on all this stuff. Okay, now you know when after Vinny asked me to do a talk on this type of thing, and I flippantly said, yeah, I can do that. And the more I sat down to it, the more I thought, oh, darn. Um, you know, this is pretty complicated stuff. A lot of moving parts. But as a forest manager, there's a lot you can do that influences how your forest is doing. And if we are in this warming trend, which we are now, and I was a little late to create openings for snowpack, okay? But if this warming drying ten trend continues, what I'm doing on my property, and, and what I would recommend is one is you look at species vulnerability to drought. Doug fir, even though it's not deep rooted, can actually dry down more than ponderosa pine. But also look at, can I manage snowpack on my site? That doesn't mean that I can't leave dense patches for, for lynx and, I mean, manage your forest as a diverse piece of ground and have your thick patches, but have your openings. Those are your water supply systems. And strategically place your openings so when that snow melts, that melt water under the current conditions now where the ground is frozen, that water will move into areas where it will stay and keep supplying. I mean, I created a, a small frog pond. I had a depression in the back of my property. I'm, you know, Lake Missoula sediment. My soil, my active soil is six inches deep. Underneath that, I have the hard pan from hell, truly. Okay, it takes me an hour to dig a fence post hole in that stuff, okay? So I had a low depression that would collect water for about a month every year. And in the last 20 years, one year, it was a really wet summer, I had a frog hatch in that little depression because the water stayed until the end of June, okay? Now, last... <clears throat> half decade, I haven't had water stay past May in there. So last year I scooped it a foot deeper with a front end loader. And so I have this little frog pond that's uh, maybe <clears throat> five times the size of this table. And now has water that's a foot and a half deep in there. And last summer it stayed till the middle of June. I didn't have a frog hatch in there, but the, the mo uh, we have some moose that come by our place. They were laying in it every day, <laughs> you know. And so that's, you know, th these are little minor improvements. I didn't need a 310 permit to do that. It wasn't a wetland, okay? It was, it was a depression that was bone dry. Don't okay? ask, don't tell. Well, uh, okay, I, yeah. I'm being recorded, so I have to be correct in what I say here. But there are minor modifications. And in our forest, everything is about water. So think about that. The more leaf canopy you have, the more interception you're going to get of snow and rain, and the more transpirational loss you're going to have off of it. So, but patches work because patches have roots that go out and it can be supplied from the surrounding landscape. So ideally, one way to manage your forest is treat it as a Swiss cheese. Okay, here's a great place to collect water. Here's a pl good place to grow trees. And the trees will tell you, even on my little property, you know, I have places where the trees are growing really well. Okay, so that's where I'm going to grow trees. I have places where the trees don't grow very well. And so I want maybe a little more opening there to collect snow to supply the rest. You know, these are, uh, the more you get into it, the more complicated it gets, the more fun it gets. I mean, I have 12 management units on my 20 acres. When I showed that to someone, uh, a forester, uh, 10, 15 years ago, I said, you're nuts, 12 management units on 20 acres, that's two management units around your house and everything else. I said, no, I got a riparian area, I've got a patch of Douglas fir here, a patch of lodgepole pine there, pon ponderosa pine there. I treat it all differently. Each one is a jigsaw puzzle, and I go, you know, every time I walk at it, you know, my, my wife says, you're not, not paying attention to me. I said, well, I'm looking at something here, you know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, but that's forest, the best forestry is site specific. And so you just got to train your eye to look at stuff and think about your strategy. I mean, every time I'm out there, I'm looking, okay. My snow patch here is going faster than I thought. Maybe it's not in the right place. What can I do to enhance that? You know, maybe I want to leave uh, a slash pile there to create some shade and I don't know. But, but that's the beauty of doing all this stuff. Now, I'll draw your attention downstairs. I created a five part YouTube video series that talks a lot about this stuff, but more also a lot more forest management type of things. Uh, it's on our webpage. Uh, the URL or the address is on a poster downstairs. Okay, so if you're really bored, they're in. I don't know, Cindy. You've reviewed these 12 to 18 minute sections. Okay, 
So it's something you can do at your own time. You know, if you got 15 minutes where you're feeling really bored and want to be challenged uh, by trying to watch this, but it's packed with information uh, to kind of capture this big picture thing. So, anyways, well, thank you. Um, I'm available for questions. So.